<laughs> hey, everybody. Thank you. We'll get started. Okay. There you go. Uh, right on time, 1130. Uh, thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. My name is Steve Luzinski. Uh, I, in my day job, work as a consultant, critical infrastructure, cybersecurity. That gives me the opportunity to come out here. And what I really enjoy is the aerospace village. So if you're over at DEF CON, please come by and visit. What I also enjoy is having spent time in and out of government, military time, which I kind of count as government because I got to see all that the government offers in that respect, uh, but also in my other job since retiring, looking at what's going on out there, what really is or isn't happening when it comes to working in the government. So then, because I have friends who know other friends that are now my friends, uh, Ian and I, uh, damn it, I knew it. Ian and I were talking about this last night, if you caught us in the uh, cavalry track, but being able to bring to this audience folks who are new to the industry, who may have been in government, and you're questioning, do I want to go back? Or you've never been in government and you're thinking about it, here's your experts. And so again, I appreciate you all coming here today and listening to us. So uh, I'll start with a quick brief introduction, go through some questions for them uh, to be able to talk and have a conversation. Um, we're gonna open it up to questions and answers at the end. So definitely think about if you wanna ask something, we may or may not have bribes up here for really good questions and things of that nature that uh, we can offer. Uh, but we want to be able to make sure that you can get your questions answered of what you want to know about folks who are working in government and what that is really like compared to what you may hear on a, you know, what we'll call the stereotypes that are out there. So let me start over here on my right. Uh, Ann Islam, <clears throat> she works in the Office of the National Cyber Director uh, on workforce issues, formerly at CISA. I have known her for several years. Uh, this is not her first time at B-Sides or in a talk. And uh, again, we got to, I had the privilege last night getting a talk with her, um, but very familiar with these issues from a workforce, what the government's dealing with and from having worked in, in government for several years. Um, next to her is Chris Paris from the Department of Veterans Affairs. Again, uh, working his uh, title as Acting Director of Cyber Workforce Management at the VA. Again, as a veteran, I especially appreciate that work, so thank you. Uh, first time joining here at B-Sides and on stage. And another first timer over here on my left, Arun Viswanathan. He is at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, um, and he leads their cyber defense engineering and research, uh, and also a number of efforts that, again, I know from the Aerospace Village uh, that uh, getting to work with Arun on and be a part of, and again, welcoming him as a first time attendee. And then finally, but not, last but not least, Tim Weston, uh, he is with TSA. Uh, he's the Director for Strategy and Risk, also Cybersecurity Policy Coordinator. He's got law degrees, he knows a lot of things and a lot of experience in government and absolutely not a stranger to this community, active in, again, the things and support with the village and other villages. You'll see him at a number of talks at DEF CON if you're there also. So again, I really appreciate you all being here. Thank you for the time and uh, I've been, in, you know, everything we've done to get ready for this. So let me start off with the, th this one I actually, I, I meant to tell you, this one I'm gonna ask all of you to go through. So how did you get into your role? How, what made you want to go into government and, and get started there? So Ian, please start us off. No, thank you for having me here. Um, so my pathway into uh, first and foremost, the cybersecurity field and then into government uh, was, being brave enough to leave my good old government job in DC government and I'm actually mid-career changer and taking the time off, which I recognize not everybody has like the opportunity and um, the time to do so, to like go get uh, a master's uh, in, in law. Uh, Cause I was thinking originally I was just gonna be a regular old government attorney and come to find out I just saw a lot of really interesting problems um, from multiple data breaches and incidents and really interesting hacks and seeing how it was impacting communities and regular citizens like you and I who are presuming that our data is protected and um, that we can just go about living our, our lives but recognizing that there are a number of organizations that we trust with our personal identifiable information. So part of me wanted to explore that a bit more and um, I was fortunate enough that first and foremost, 
being a grad student and learning about cybersecurity policy hackathons uh, through the Atlantic Council and engaging there to then finding out that there was also a summer internship uh, working very closely with a lot of members within I Am The Cavalry community who are also, uh, were leading the cyber statecraft initiative at the time. And uh, from there on, building the resume and portfolio to showcase that my pre-existing policy and government affairs skills were transferable. I needed to layer on the cybersecurity knowledge, getting firsthand knowledge, also learning from the community as well, how to serve as a translator to then go into DHS, uh, and this is CISA's uh, original name, which was National Programs and Protection Directorate, so uh, participating in a job fair and meeting with a hiring manager. So that was actually like my foray into federal government, getting into the cybersecurity policy career, and making a lot of connections, um, not only within the federal space, but realizing that I still needed to stay tuned and tied to different communities and going to the various cons, whether it was like B-Size Las Vegas or even B-Size DC, Nova, Charm, Delaware, elsewhere to like stay plugged into what are the current issues because my portfolio actually started off as a cybersecurity strategist, like serving a multitude of portfolios to then aviation cyber um, and uh, dealing with workforce and training issues as well. So there was a lot of different projects which I thought was very interesting and helpful and so that was my entryway into government. Excellent, yeah, hey, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Excellent, can't fix this. Um, so I, I think it's worth me starting off that I have a very liberal arts background. Uh, I studied theology, uh, philosophy, German, English. I actually wanted, to, I thought I wanted to be a teacher. So um, I put out like a dozen applications, didn't hear back. Luckily I had a internship at a, a healthcare IT startup at the time. Um, I, I quickly invested myself more in that career, got into uh, more SOC 2, type 2 audits with the security and privacy teams, uh, got a mentor who was the chief operating officer who encouraged me uh, to actually go back to school for cybersecurity. So I, at night, I took cybersecurity policy classes, um, found out that the Social Security Administration was looking for InfoSec personnel on a whim, threw my application in there, and uh, it took a while, but after a year, I got a federal position. I worked under their, their CISO, and I was doing training, policy, education, uh, and I also ran their social engineering program, which I found, uh, coming from a, a less technical background, probably least uh, a, you know, technical of many in the room, there was a great fit between the, the psychology aspect uh, of what I was doing, the, the liberal arts, the, the communication, and then needing that cybersecurity uh, technical piece as well. Um, from there, I supported our CISO in looking at our workforce, where we needed to grow, what capacity we needed to be at, what types of certs, training, experiences our folks needed to have, um, and that brought me to where I'm at now, which is VA. Uh, I, I came over under the prospect of being able to engage more externally, so not just being confined to my department, but actually engaging with folks like IAN and being able to affect change at a federal level. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at now. Absolutely. Yeah. Arun? Hey. <clears throat> Thanks, Steve. Um, so JPL is a little bit different than government. JPL is uh, what's called an FFRDC, a federally funded research and development center. So it's, it's not government, but it is sort of semi-government. It's funded by NASA, but we are managed by Caltech. So it has a more campusy feel to how JPL works. Uh, so my, uh, so I have a, uh, I had, uh, I got my PhD in computer science with a focus on cyber from USC. And while doing that, I got to intern at JPL for a couple of uh, times, really loved the culture, loved the work that they were doing. And then around that time, space cyber was really becoming very critical and not many people were really thinking about space cyber. Now, if you look at, for example, Aviation Village and so on, there's so much talk about space cyber. That wasn't the case in 2015, 2014. Um, so, uh, for me, that was a very interesting opportunity because I didn't want to go into a field in cyber which was already saturated. Uh, for example, network security was very saturated by then. There's so much work on NACs and firewalls and all that stuff that um, it was hard to sort of make an impact. And of course, I loved space, so this was a perfect opportunity to combine my uh, interests in cyber and space together. Um, and so 
I, I was recruited around the time when they were setting up the cyber, uh, the, the, the cyber defense uh, for our missions. Um, so we always had, JPL always had the IT security and IT infrastructure and all that stuff, but they never had a mission cybersecurity team. Uh, so we were sort of the first hires uh, to build that capability. Um, so, so my team, so at, 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 at JPL, my team works on all aspects of a mission from the ground systems to the communication to the spacecraft and sort of doing an end-to-end -end security uh, of that. Uh, and it involves many different things, like uh, things like compliance, uh, risk management, risk analysis, threat analysis, threat intelligence, uh, and to many advanced research topics because such a new field, there is a lot of scope for uh, research on uh, new ways of doing things. So a lot of my time, uh, I mean, I started out as a researcher in the group. Now I manage the group and we have a broad spectrum of activities, like all the way from doing engineering, like day-to-day -day engineering, to also doing advanced research. Uh, so I think, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Steve, and good morning. Uh, as Steve said, I'm, a, I'm actually a recovering attorney now. I discovered I have a heart and a soul. It's kind of shocking. Um, I got into government early on, and I think it was mainly, I come from a long line of teachers and civil servants. Uh, so going into government out of law school was just kind of what made sense to me. Uh, I initially started at the uh, city of Oklahoma City doing litigation and working with them on a multitude of issues, uh, issues related to like, water treatment, um, excessive use of force cases, uh, fire department related matters. Um, ultimately got recruited into a program out in DC because uh, I, because of that litigation background, they were looking for attorneys uh, who had some, you know, kind of unique experiences to help with some programs that DHS was standing up. Uh, through that, I went to uh, George Washington University, got my master's of law degree, much like Ian. Um, and national security and U.S. foreign relations. And it was there that I really unlocked, you know, that interest in cybersecurity policy. And I had always dabbled in cybersecurity electronics. I worked at Creative Labs when I was in college. And, you know, that was just something fun to do. Uh, and then I was like, wait a minute, I can actually do something with this. Um, from there, though, I started asking questions. I got to TSA. I was like, hey, well, great, we have this counterterrorism mission, this protection mission, there's this line in our authorizing statute that says the TSA administrator shall review cybersecurity threats to aviation. What are we doing about that? And started to kind of pull on that and out of that started kind of building a, a legal practice within our chief counsel's office. Uh, as Steve said, I've been coming out here for summer camp for years and I had actually about six years ago, I got back from DEF CON and there was a knock on my door and it was from our chief of staff and said, hey, we need to develop a cybersecurity strategy and we hear you're the one to help us with that. So just just make I, that happen. Yeah. Let's can you can you can you solve that overnight? Um, but that I took that left what I was doing in the chief counsel's office, moved into the policy side, um, helped draft our cybersecurity roadmap, which was a five year strategy. And then from that have helped then build out the various cybersecurity policy related issues and measures that TSA is kind of leading on today. So yeah. it was a kind of a wandering path to get there, but it's uh, it's been an interesting one. Yeah, absolutely. So hopefully as you're seeing, and what was exciting for me to bring this group together is so many different backgrounds, cybersecurity, kind of not cyber, all aspects of cyber because I'm not super technical either. So I appreciated being able to have the smart technicians who can answer those questions and, and things from there. So uh, one of the things I mentioned up front, stereotypes, right? This whole title of separating fact from fiction, there are stereotypes out there. I know uh, one of the things that I always heard sitting here when I was in the military, call myself a govy at the time, looking to get a job as I'm getting out, thinking about staying in the cybersecurity field, what can I contribute, things like that, where do I go private sector? mission was always thrown out. Well, the government's got a mission. Okay, I get that and I appreciate it with my background. Uh, but Tim, let me start with you. Not only did you get into it, as we've all talked about it, but you're, you're certainly still there and we've all been in, in different areas, but what keeps you in that job? It is cliche, but it is that mission-oriented focus. Uh, you know, transportation's one of those critical infrastructure sectors that affects everyone. Everyone utilizes it every single day. 
you may not utilize the health sector every day. You may not go to the hospital every day. I, at least I hope you don't, unless you're a doctor or a nurse, in which case, please continue to go to the hospital. Um, you know, not everyone uses dams every day, but you know, maybe you drink water that comes from a, a reservoir or you use electricity that comes from it. But transportation is something that is used by everyone. It's global um, and helping to secure that system and make that system more resilient is kind of what keeps me going. You know, it's, it's that challenge. It's a, it's an unattainable challenge, I think, but that's what I like about it. It's it, it, there's something more we can keep doing to make it better. Yeah. And if you don't mind, Tim, I'll, I'll think back off that. So, uh, I joined government because I was starting a family and I wanted stability. And my dad was 30 years prior military Worked for the government after that as a civilian. And, uh, that's all I heard, right? Secure a job, get it. Once you're in, you're in. Um, some of that is true. Absolutely. Uh, but what, I think the better question is why, why have I stayed for the last 12 years? Um, and for that, that answer um, for me is that I get to work for an organization that is not profit driven. At the end of the day, I can, if I need to, and there are times when I need to, I hit that wall, I think about other careers, I think about what, what I've done, where I've, where I've gone, where I wanna go. I can draw a connection between what I'm doing Yes, it's three layers down, four layers down from the veteran that I'm serving, but I can draw that connection. I can say that I'm building the best freaking workforce for our veterans who are gonna give them the best care, the best technology, the best solutions. And honestly, that's what keeps me moving. Um, that and I found that once you're in, there are so many possibilities. Um, I won't go into all of them, but as a, as a policy and strategy planner, workforce developer, I can take my skill set that I've honed I can go work for AN at, at ONCD. I can go help them develop the National Cyber Workforce Education Strategy. I can go to OSTP, work on federal AI policy. I can work for OPM. It's just, once you're in, there's a, a, a multitude of ways that you can apply that skill set without needing to leave the federal government. And we can address all those acronyms afterwards. Sorry. Yeah. They're you're, good. Be attached, and I'm like, yeah, I know what you're saying, but I'm with you, I'm with you, so. Um, Personnel management, that's right. Office of Science and Technology Policy, yeah. Office of the National Cyber Director. Absolutely. So sorry, I won't do that again. No, no, that's and, yeah, that's okay. And I was just going to quickly interject yeah, to say that it it really helps also um, from my vantage point where I'm working, where having subject matter experts like Chris, like Arun, like Tim in their respective agencies, where we can then go in and say, what are you seeing in your space? Please give us, you know, best practices, advice. And also, as we're developing the National Cyber Workforce and Education Strategy, which was launched last week, um, then we want to make sure that the work that we're looking to then move forward during implementation phase is not just coming straight out of the White House. It's going to be a whole of nation effort, a whole society effort. We recognize that there's so many owners of different processes and and also literally like the, the doors and the gates that will let you in to different places. So what is it that we can do to remove the red tape, to remove those barriers, to make things more accessible and not and you know, increasing the knowledge and awareness to then have more awesome folks like us that's in the room out in this field too. Yeah. Awesome. I appreciate that. Um so I mean, again, stereotypes, that's the theme. That's the thing I've learned to, how do you get past those? So what's the biggest stereotype you've seen that's true or that you've seen and you're like, that's completely not true? I am. And I'm going to keep going back to I am. No, no, I totally. So. I think we were, we were talking about this uh, early in, earlier during prep was like bureaucracy. Um, that's red the easy tape. One. Yeah. yeah. It's that, what are the, what are the ways in? Oh, what does government do? Actually, what does your agency do? Actually, how does my role translate into this 2210 IT specialist position that you're advertising on usajobs.gov? Um, I see the job announcement, but I'm really interested and eager. I'm trying to frame my resume a certain way to make sure that you know I can get picked up through the system, but I'm also not very clear as to what your day-to-day -day entails and what your mission set is. So there's, there, there are those levers, those levers and issues, but we also recognize that uh, some of us do a better job of branding and going out and explaining who we are and what we do, 
Um, and some of us need a lot, of, a lot more work and support in that area. And yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll piggyback off that. So bureaucracy, yeah, that's, that's like the easy target here. It's, it's everywhere. Um, looking at the federal hiring, right? Like we don't talk language that would be recognizable to everyone here. We, we, we say that, that we want an IT specialist in our announcements and we're actually looking for a defense analyst or an incident responder. Um, so why don't we do that, right? Like why don't we change the titling? Why don't we uh, very clearly in the job description tell you what we're actually gonna assess you against and then follow through with an assessment to make sure you get the skills that uh, you say you do. Those are things that we are working on, which is exciting, but something that, you know, a stereotype that I've had to come to, to grips with is we move slow. We move a lot slower than I would like. Um, I've had to temper my expectations without being jaded and saying, all right, well, that's just what it is. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's the biggest stereotype that I would agree with. The one that I disagree with um, is that the government is as a whole very inefficient or you could even say lazy, that workers are lazy. Um, I don't know if I've just had a very fortunate experience or I intentionally choose to surround myself with people who are not lazy, but that is the biggest or, or furthest thing that has been from my experience. I work with amazing people. Um, now granted, are there, are there inefficiencies at VA and the government? Absolutely. Are there inefficiencies in your private sector companies? Absolutely. Um, for me, it's been just surrounding myself, picking those people who are going to encourage me uh, and having them surround me to be a better person. Yeah, and, and so. I'll add in just my own perspective of both government time uh, back at CISA in the middle of a crisis, and there was still uncertainty about making the changes. And like, hey, this is a crisis, we should act fast. Certain things work really well, certain things didn't. And then in my current job, it's a very large company, there's tons of the paperwork and bureaucracy. So uh, even in the private sector, trying to build a security team, hey, let's get this job description out, took time. And that was a small company example and a big one too. So did I miss anything? Yeah. yeah. So I can, so another, a stereotype that I do not agree with is that cybersecurity is all technical. I mean, there are so many aspects of cyber that um, are often overlooked, like legal, for example, policy, um, human uh, interfacing. Uh, th those are all like so many, uh, just, just a few of the important aspects of cyber. So you don't need to have a cyber path to get into cybersecurity. There are so many different ways to get into cybersecurity. Um, and I'm, I mean, an example would be uh, in my own work, um, I mean, I lead tasks where we uh, work with uh, people across different domains. It's not, everybody in my team is not just a cybersecurity engineer. They are people who understand same missions. They are people who understand uh, human machine interfacing. How do, uh, how should you build interfaces that work for humans? Uh, how do you do, how do you d design processes that a human being can use? Or how do you integrate cybersecurity into a mission environment? So there are so many um, dimensions to cybersecurity that often it comes, I mean, just because everybody uh, equates cybersecurity to hacking, that's sort of the first uh, obvious thing, but there's so much beyond that uh, that often gets overlooked. So there's so many opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm with um, I, I mentioned my time at CISA, that was a very specific, focused on COVID, but very rewarding as that was a favorite thing I did as hard as it was, uh, but getting in to come in and focus on that. And what are the projects, what are the things that you've done? Arun, you, you mentioned you, your favorite thing that you did, you're like, that's why I'm here and I like doing this. Okay, so yeah, so I mean at JPL, so one of the first things that uh, is really the impact that you're making because it's a problem that uh, nobody really bothered with before our team was set up, right? So uh, the first thing that we started doing was really getting people aware. Uh, there are many things that we've done over the last eight years of my, uh, you know, eight years that I've been at JPL. Uh, one of the things was we really uh, tried to make the management aware of the problems by actually doing a live fishing demo. We live fished a section of the management and showed them the results as to how easy it is for somebody to get to fish you. And so how easy it is for somebody to just using information available outside on Google, on your LinkedIn profiles, on your published papers, all that information to craft a phishing email to make you click a link and you know, get malware installed on. Of course, we didn't install malware, but the message was, uh, was, was conveyed. Uh, because the, 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 the thinking often is that 
we are all behind firewalls. Why should we bother? Why would anybody bother with us? So that old that mentality had to go. So that was one thing. The other thing is we've also done a lot of work in uh, really pushing the boundaries on like using technologies like AI and um, other new technologies to build solutions that are now actually helping our missions do their work well. Um, so, I mean, uh, all in all, I think it's been a it's been very rewarding because when when I joined, there was really uh, sort of an uh, there were it was just too hard to sell cyber to people. It was always the question came back, what is my return on investment? Which is a very hard question to answer for cyber. But now with these demonstrations, and of course the situation has changed. There's a lot of federal laws now that NASA has to follow. There's also a lot of threats out there which are uh, much more severe and people read, there's often, there's more press coverage for threats. Um, like the last year's incident uh, with Wysat, right before the, uh, you know, the, the uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, that was a big event. So that really opened up people to, okay, so this is now possible. So this is something like hitting close to home. Um, so yeah, so all the work that we've done, all, the, all that we've been saying is sort of now starting to sort of really pay off and that's very rewarding. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Tim, I'm gonna throw this question to you. What's the one thing about government service people don't know? It's not even a stereotype, it's a hidden secret of getting the opportunity to work where you have. Well, it's hidden. Why would I? T no. <laughs> um, Not that. The, the opportunity to work with so many amazing people. And, and I know that that, you know, you get that with a lot of different organizations, but kind of like, like Ian and Chris were saying down there, like the collaboration I see across, especially the cybersecurity community within the federal government really is encouraging because it's one of those unifying uh, threat streams. And, and you have a lot of people who are really dedicated to working together to solve that problem, um, you know, and I didn't, I didn't respond to the stereotype that I disagree with, and it would, you know, I think Chris kind of touched on it, you know, the lazy government worker um, out there. There might be in or inefficiencies. Yes, you're going to have those in any and every organization, but my experience has been the exact opposite. It's a lot of very dedicated people who work long hours sometimes, you know, when needed uh, to respond to a crisis or to avert a crisis or be proactive in preventing that crisis. And, and I actually see a lot more of that work on that prevention side. I mean, we're, we're working together, coming up with creative solutions, learning how to leverage the bureaucracy to help us. Uh, you know, the old attorney in me is, you know, process is your friend. And, in, and it's needed in some cases. You want to make sure that what you're doing, you know, you don't have government overreach in certain areas, especially I work for a regulator. So working, you know, within that regulatory sphere, you don't want to have overreach on cybersecurity based regulations. But you have to balance that with, all right, well, there is a real need, though, to affect some kind of change here, because sometimes that voluntary model just doesn't work. So what what's the creative solution to fix that? Um, so to me, that the hidden gem is, you know, working with some really good, creative, and dedicated people who really want to dig in and solve those problems. Yeah. That connects back to the mission. Go ahead. Hey, Steve, can I, I want to go yeah, back please. actually to the project question because um, Arun, you said something that I wanted to touch on, which is the diversity of skill sets within the cyber workforce, the cybersecurity workforce, um, and it also ties into this project that uh, I'm really proud of. So in, in 2019, we had. Uh, some of you may know the NICE workforce framework. It says, hey, there's 52 different types of cyber worker, but who reads special publications and 50 pages of PDF? We, <laughs> yeah, A.N. does. Uh, actually, I'm she guilty too. To. Yeah. Uh, so but we said, look, no one is actually going to interact with a, a static PDF document. So we worked with CISA, we worked with DOD, and we built this tool called the Cyber Career Pathways tool. Um, just Google it. If you haven't seen it, check it out, because I, I feel like there might be someone like me in the room who's like, you know what, I'm not really technical, but I want to get into this, this field. It shows all the different types of roles you can play. I mean, there's, there's the legal piece, there's the workforce development, there's the training, there's the project management, and then all of your traditional technology roles in there. Um, so it's a really cool tool that helps, uh, helps me and it helps uh, others engage on the types of ways that you can get involved. You can be uh, in the cybersecurity workforce without being hands on the keyboard, you know, 24 seven. And then I do want to touch on for 18 months, I led this effort 
to try to get our technologists and our cybersecurity practitioners better pay. Because for years it's been, you know, it's a 20 year problem of government does not pay anything close to what industry can. Um, but no one was re really willing to take up the mantle and say, all right, well, let's do something about it. We had special rates and they were aging from, you know, 2003 onward. Uh, so uh, I'm really happy to say that we built this justification. We submitted it, it got approved. Um, as of last month, VA is paying 17% more across the board. Um, that's not a plug for hiring, but you know, if you want to work for us, sure. But just in case. It, just in case, <laughs> come talk to me after. Um, but we were genuinely hopeful that every other agency is going to look to us. They're going to either congratulate us or they're going to say, that's not fair. And then they're going to go talk to Congress. They're going to talk to you know, their, their appropriators and say, how do we follow suit? Um, yeah. And hopefully that, that's government-wide change. And then meanwhile, where I'm at, we're uh, working closely with our colleagues within the executive office of the president, um, uh, you know, uh, Office of Management and Budget, also as well as, uh, as uh, Chris also mentioned earlier, Office of Science, Technology, Policy, National Security Council, Domestic Policy Council, the list goes on, because we're trying to ensure that the skill sets, both technical and non-technical, are adequately represented. For example, there's a lot of talk, and you'll see this um, coming up later in the week at DEF CON, that there's a lot of talk also around AI, and how do we also get ready for that next set of workforce. And the thing is, regardless of the technology, we need to have a workforce that is ready to go at any given point in time, regardless of what the tool may be, and it's just, uh, not essentially like a plug and play, but almost an ability to like, okay, how can we ramp up and afford people the opportunities to on ramp and off ramp wherever they want. So similar to what Chris mentioned with the cyber career pathway tools and also looking at government resources, such as the National uh, Initiative for Cybersecurity un of Education under NIST, uh, the National Institutes for Standards and Technology is that you, you want to afford folks also a chance who are technical because you might be interested one day in becoming the boss, right? You're gonna then have to become a supervisor. You're then also gonna have to have that leadership training and budget training to understand what does that really mean to you know, manage and oversee a team and the project where your technical expertise now is now training and providing that professional development and learning to then mentor and, and groom and build, you know, your your organization and your portfolio too. So there there it is a two way uh, streak. And the other piece, also a hidden part that may not be commonly known, is there are a lot of folks who work in government who also to work used to work in private sector and academia and in community based organizations and in hospitals and just decided you know i'm i'm really ready for a change and this is a time and i'm 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 really eager to you know prov uh, provide you know this public service so and there is that transition like i personally um, stepped out for a little bit and went into the think tank world after CISA um, to our street institute and uh, that was like an interesting opportunity where the visibility I had I had a chance to learn more hear more provide constructive criticism and then take that skill set now and bring it back to where I'm currently at um, with ONCD office of national cyber director so just want to also share that you know those pathways are ever changing just as our lives are also dynamic and ever changing I think that's one I'll, I'll, I'm a big fan watching what U.S. Digital Service has done, the idea that you can come in and stay for an entire career, you can come in and out, you can do it. There's all these options. The government has realized, and you're seeing it, the government's on stage, the government's present. Spot the Fed is boring these days. DEFCON's the same way. That's good. They are coming in to engage where you, the subject matter experts are, where you want to learn more about what they do, and the same way. So getting to see that over time has been uh, great in that change. So I failed at the very beginning. I meant to ask, and I apologize to my panel here, uh, for our audience, who has never worked in government? Okay. Who has worked in government at least once at some point? Steve, I saw you sneak in. Awesome. Yeah, so we got a good diverse in the sense of experiences to talk and share and things of that nature again what we want to do and really what i hope that you're seeing and it was mentioned before is the diverse backgrounds it can be a full-time 
one career, you know, different jobs and all the things Tim's got to do. It can be in and out of government. The three of us have had private sector. Ian has had private sector experience. It's things you can choose because that flexibility is what people are looking for. And then especially the very technical background, the very not technical backgrounds and the things that are still cybersecurity. And so the beauty of being able to understand where you can fit in no matter what you're looking at. And then the other examples we talked about was people who are technical that don't want to be. They want to move over into the risk management side or they want to get in and just those opportunities that government offers there too. So, um, so panel, I'll give you the last question. And again, I'll open it up for, for all of you. If somebody wants to do this, they want to follow your path, what do you recommend? Either like definitely do this or definitely don't, you know, mistakes you've made, things they can learn from. Uh, but what could you offer the audience who may be interested in these types of things? Hey, and you want to start off? Yeah. So um, I'm going to kick off with a plug. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, uh, White House released the National Cyber Workforce and Education Strategy. Please go to whitehouse.gov slash cyber workforce. Uh, we created, it's not just a strategy. We, because we understand again, there's some folks who will love to dig, dig into the details. So if you have time to read a 60 page document, please do so. Go crazy. If you don't, there are fact sheets and cheat sheets and action sheets. So we have um, a set of action sheets that are, are catered to the workers, the educators, government and employers have a chance to see there's a it's a one pager it's even shorter than one pager when you have the the the, the banner and and the and the templatey uh, stuff that there will be resources there available that will point to a number of government resources nice says a VA uh, if you're also interested in the uh, um, intelligence side of the house there's multiple avenues and also for the educators how can we support our K through 12 systems um, uh, community colleges higher education we're looking at this as a whole of nation society and an ecosystem approach recognizing that we're all uh, a, a part of this uh, beautiful space. So if you're very interested, not only for yourself, but also sharing those resources to your friends, your families and colleagues, I would recommend that um, you start there and pick which one you feel would be suitable for your needs. Thank you. Cool. Chris? Excellent. Yeah, so Ann talked about the, the resources, so um, I won't cover that. Uh, I, in the beginning, I told you I had a very liberal arts background, theology, philosophy, English, German. Um, for me, something like if you, I guess if you want to follow in my footsteps, be curious, be deeply curious about the world around you. Why are, why are we doing what we're doing? How are we doing it? Does it need to change? And what's the role that you're going to play in that change? Um, the other thing is my, when I started my government career, my dad told me it's easy to stand out. And I said, all right, well, how? Embrace challenges. You, you will stand out very quickly if you're the one raising your hand. There's an extra assignment. Oh, yeah, I got it. No problem. I'll, I don't know it. I'll figure it out. That's, that's worked wonders for me in my career. And then lastly, um, my recommendation, but it's also one of my biggest regrets, is not finding a mentor sooner. Um, you have a, a, a career trajectory that you want to go down. Find someone on it. Ask to talk with them. Ask if they'll take you under their wing. Because in finding that person, they're going to know best, you know, you should pursue this experience. You should talk to this person. You should take this this class or get this certification. I can't tell you how beneficial, finally, when I did find a mentor, those conversations have been to my career. So find someone that will help you and stick with that person. Yeah, I think everything that uh, both Chris and Anna said, and then um, if you're really looking for, I think the uh, first thing that would be really uh, choose your domain where you want to focus on. Like, are you interested in space? Are you interested in IoT? Because cybersecurity is, affects every single thing. So, um, I mean, I would r recommend becoming sort of, not becoming uh, a generalist, but sort of focusing on a domain because there is, then there's more scope and you can grow better. If you are a generalist, um, it's also good, but it, then you need a, a much more, a much uh, more rigorous cybersecurity background to become a generalist. But let's say if you pick like IoT or healthcare and so on, there's so many problems in those areas that it's easy to start off with. And every area is looking for people to uh, come and contribute. Um, I don't know, somebody said 
the there's like 700,000 jobs in the cybersecurity sector uh, that that remain to be filled. Uh, I think that's true with, even across like private and there's just so many jobs out there. Um, so pick your domain and then uh, in terms of the resources, I think the NIST NICE framework, if nothing, it will at least provide you a list of those jobs that you can look at the list and say, okay, this is what I think I'm interested in. Cyber like, Career Pathways to a, Tool. Sorry? Cyber Career Pathways Tool. <laughs> yes, 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 Cyber Career Pathways Tool. So you can look at the job descriptions and see what really appeals to you. Do you want to be a SOC analyst? Do you want to be a vulnerability researcher? Do you want to do risk management? Do you want to do compliance? There's like so many of them and every, and there's hiring in almost every every area. So yeah, that would be my job. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. The joy of being last, you get to say, yes, I agree with everything. Um, and, I, and I do, actually. Uh, I, I, Chris, what Chris said, you know, have a curiosity. And I think that's something that's, you know, you see that across the hacker community, the researcher community. We all have that kind of innate curiosity. How do things work? Why do they work the way they do? And how can I make them better? Um, you know, I would rather hire someone with that level of curiosity who may not necessarily have the technical skills behind it. I can't teach you desire. I can't teach you a want to do something. You have to have that in yourself. I can teach you the technical aspects. I can send you to a boot camp. I can send you out here to listen to talks and engage with others in that technical community to at least get you a, a level of understanding to help do the job that we want you to do but if you don't want to do that job, I can't take that. So for me, the way and my approach to hiring in and bringing people in, um, and I think you'll see this as you kind of engage with, and please, if you're coming to DEF CON, uh, come see us. We have a booth at DEF CON this year and we're hiring. Um, you know, don't poke too much fun at us. Uh, we do work for the government and there may or may not be cookies. Um, no, seriously, I have cookies here, if anyone wants cookies after this. Well, that's um, yeah, I got you. I got you. Um, but what I can't, like I said, I really can't, you know, stress enough, have a desire, have that curiosity to learn and want to do more. Um, and I also agree, get a mentor. Um, they're very useful. And regardless, I think, of what career you choose or where your path is, have a mentor. Ideally, have a mentor both in the career you want and outside of the career you want. Uh, some of the best advice I ever got was the best job you're going to get is the job you didn't apply for. And I found that to be very true within just my own experience. I never thought I would be in the position I'm in today when I started law school, you know, when I started even my undergraduate degree, which was in accounting, you know, talk about being boring. Uh, I wanted to work for the FBI. That was my, that was kind of like my ultimate goal. Like, hey, I'm going to do accounting. I'm going to go to law school. I took Russian. I had it all set. I don't use any of that right now. Well, a little bit. Uh, but you never know where you're going to end up. And, and you don't know where you're going to end up if you don't take the opportunity to ask people for that advice and look for those opportunities that may not be apparent at first sight. Awesome. So before I'm, we're right at the tail end, we've got time just for a couple of questions. I want to make sure, I told the panelists I would make sure because I want the opportunities. If you're interested, there's tons of resources, QR codes that are up there for both TSA and VA, other links. You have these experts. Again, I'm a big fan having done the back and forth and seen the value. So if you're interested, absolutely. And of course, they're up here. Uh, but let me thank the panel, first of all, for your time, the preparation, and the, the great words that you've said before I open it up. So thank you all. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Ted. Seriously, someone come get cookies. Yes, yeah, so we, in the question session to help you get motivated, uh, and I know we have microphones, so wait for the microphone to come to you, but right here, sir, in the hat. And Drake, you tell me when to, when to stop. Can I ask a multi-part question? All right, 26 like, parts. Like six parts or yeah. two? <laughs> maybe two, maybe three. Two, two um, sounds good. Um, the first part of the question is, you mentioned training and, and learning and, and things like that. How is the government's budget on getting the training and the learning? Do they, are they good at that? Is that fact or fiction or, or does that lie? 
So historically, I think it's varied. The approach we're taking at TSA and that I'm kind of, I'm really trying to build out is when we put together our, our uh, FY24 and FY25 federal budgets and I put in there, look, we need 200 positions. In addition to that, when I went forward and I met with our appropriators and we were in working with uh, the staff to build out that budget, I said, I also need money for training and development. And I actually, and it's, it's put in there. Now, what, you know, we'll see what we get because we're dependent upon whatever the Congress passes for a federal budget, but we're trying to be very proactive. Uh, you, again, back to my, you know, kind of the theme, I'd much rather send my employees out to learn and engage and you have to have money to do it. You can't just eat that out of your operating budget because you're not going to grow and you're not going to get the knowledge transfer that you need. So we're working very hard. Like we have some money within each of our our cybersecurity uh, programs that allow for that. Um, and again, that's one of the reasons. Like this year, I think we've got about 30 different people from TSA who are out here, at, you know, doing trainings at Black Hat, uh, attending DEF CON, you know using that opportunity to learn and engage, uh, you have to build it in though, and you have to be proactive. So for the sake of time, I think that's a fairly consistent across all your agencies, would you agree? I would say it's also how we, pri how we allocate the training, right? Okay. So up until a couple years ago, it was just, oh, what cert do you want to take? What's the new shiny thing? With the NICE framework and these work roles that are beyond just your IT specialist, we're able to say, Hey, you, you know, you are a vulnerability assessment analyst. Here is training, certifications, courseware that actually maps to your job. So I think we're able to allocate the limited training budget we do have to courseware and experiences that actually align to someone uh, in what they do. Yeah, and the thing is real quick is that um, also when you're applying and you have the conversations with uh, departments and agencies, make sure that's an ask. So because a lot of times that's actually the biggest incentive that get government can give. It's, um, it's, the, it's the training, it's the retention bonus. There's like a few things that it's not commonly known and uh, training is one of them um, that is a, a highly negotiate, negotiable piece, but it's also standard depending on which agency you're, you're going to. Um, and they'll give you the flexibility to, to use the training, um, how you see fit as it matches, you know, your role. Perfect. All right. What, one more and then second question. Sure. Really yes. quick, sorry. Um, the, the one thing I've always heard about the government is that they're more open to uh, diversity and inclusions and stuff like that than you would get mo ma um, in other sectors, m mainly around neurodivergent uh, individuals, right? Um, is that fact or is that fiction? And can you speak to that? It's a, it's a fact because I, so my, the team that I run, uh, JPL, I can speak for JPL, very heavily uh, supportive of DEIA. We have our own DEIA office that was set up a couple of years ago, and my own team has neurodivergent people. Uh, and honestly, in my opinion, uh, that diversity is very important for cybersecurity. Even neurodiversity is very important for cybersecurity because you get very different perspectives. And uh, I mean, my, and my uh, half of my team is actually here at Black Hat and DEF CON this, uh, uh, this year. And, yeah, we have all kinds of people, yes. Awesome, thank you. Uh, was there another, I think you had your hand up first, and then we'll get to you in the back. A real quick question, actually. Um, I've seen all your job postings and so on available. What is a GS-13 or GS-14? What does that mean in, a in, a, in, a, you know, in our world? Well, public world, I mean. So that's just the scaling. So GS is general services uh, scaling, so it's, uh, Different job series have different classifications, so you can look it up in the, the Office of Personnel Management. They have the different, oops, sorry, breakouts of like, you know, a GS-12, I think, is like a, anywhere from like $70,000 to $111,000, whatever, you know. Um, and it covers like what they get paid and the general set of responsibilities that right, they get, right? Yeah, so it, it, again, this is the kind of one of the problems from government. We use classification systems that are unique to government. They don't translate well to private sector. Um, you know, we're working, that's one of the things we're all collectively, I mean, as we were at dinner last night, I mean, we're all working to fix that and kind of break that model. But at the end of the day, again, back to the bureaucracy, you're kind of bound to some of that. Yeah. And okay, let's, let's grab 
Real know, quick while we're say, moving the microphone, yeah, we get one last question and then I'm getting the hook. Point but, to that we have an yeah. interagency working group where we're having these conversations because we're also recognizing that there are disparities as well. So that's one of the things that we're hoping to work on mm -hmm. uh, moving forward. Okay, I promised. All right, we will get you afterwards. Go ahead. Last question. Hi, I usually don't need microphone. I have to use my teacher's voice. So. I have many students who are graduating with cybersecurity degrees. And also we have government agency that contacting us and asking for people to apply. And you know what the biggest issue now? Government is not cannabis friendly. When is kind of going to overcome this problem? Like I have students denied because they use cannabis. That is, uh, that's a good one. Uh, I know I have it, so, so let me help you all out. Thanks. I know in our company, right, that's a consideration. Let me use an example, I won't even get into that. Let me use an example, being in the military, 10, not even 10 years ago, 2007, looking at cybersecurity issues, how do we do things better in the military? And the answer was, you can have a bunch of dudes that look like me, there's only so many of them, and they only have so many talents or you can open it up. For example, you come to an event like this and she has purple hair and that dude has a mohawk and they look different and they look weird to you all and they may have done those things, but if you don't find a way to engage them because they're smart and they got the talent, you're not going to benefit. So trying to open that aperture, there is no set answer, both on the government side and the private side, but it is, it is an issue and I know folks are trying to look at it and figure it out. So. This is awesome, thank you. Again, I'm getting the big hook and I wanna make sure we'll be available, the panelists will be available. So thank you again for your time, we really appreciate it.